And welcome to another screencast here in Immunology and Serology. I am your professor for today, Dr. Sipache Basit. And for today's session, we will be talking about the serologic and molecular diagnosis of parasitic and fungal infection. So as the chapter overview, uh, we will be dividing this particular session into two major parts. So the first part will be about parasitic infections, wherein we will have the review of the types of parasites that wherein um, serologic and molecular diagnostic tests would be applicable, the immune response to parasites, the parasite survival strategies, the laboratory diagnosis of various parasitic examples such as the toxoplasmosis. And as regards to the fungal infections, of course, we will have the review of the different characteristics of fungi, the classification of mycosis, the immune responses to fungi, laboratory diagnosis of fungal infections, and the selected examples of fungal infections. So, let's proceed. So, when we say parasites, of course, it came from the Greek word parasiton, which means that someone is eating on another table. So, when we say parasites, these are primarily microorganisms and survive, they can actually survive by living off from the other organisms. Okay, so most of the time, these hosts are humans. Okay, so primarily, we can classify parasites as to the protozoan, the single-celled unicellular organisms that can live and multiply inside the human host. And then, of course, we have the helminths, which include the parasitic worms and some other parasites or the multicellular parasites that live on the skin of the host, such as, of course, the uh, the, the ticks, lice. So, um, being an antigen, of course, um, our immune system will also produce immune responses to these parasites. Okay? So, it could be the innate defense, wherein phagocytosis and, and cytokine production would still be possible, or it could be a specific or adaptive immune response, wherein the primary immunoglobulin that will be produced against any parasitic infection would be IgE. And of course, the antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity response would also be possible. Having said that, the possible outcomes would, of course, would include or hopefully would be eradication of parasites. Okay. However, in some cases, there could be it, there could be death of host and establishment of a persistent infection, meaning to say this parasitic infection would somehow become chronic infection. Okay, so there are several strategies that can be utilized by these parasites in order for them to survive for a much longer period of time inside the host cell. So one of the most common way in which they can actually um, survive much longer would be the antigenic concealment okay which means that parasites antigen remain inside of host cells so plasmodium species that can cause malaria is an example so hypnocytes can remain hidden in the liver for a very long period of time okay and then of course some of them would be capable of antigenic variation wherein uh, they vary their surface antigen. So let's say, for example, um, the tripon trypanosomes will alter their surface glycoproteins be because they have this gene switching. They are capable of gene switching. And then Leishmania will have a very complex life cycle form. So, you know, are familiar still with uh, 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 the different um, forms, a mastigote from a mastigote, promastigote, and so on. Okay, some of them would be capable of antigen shedding. Okay, so which means that some parasites will even shed surface antigen, and this particular surface antigen will bind to the host antibodies and cells. Okay, so that way they are protected and then they will survive for a much longer period of time inside the human host. Okay. And then some of them will do the so-called antigenic mimicry, which means that parasites will express epitopes that are similar or 
identical to host molecules. So, when the sarcaria okay, of the cytosomes enter our body, so sometimes they will utilize even our very own tissue to cover themselves up and then uh, the, the cells of the immune system will not be able to recognize them. Okay? Some of them will, will have a strategy such as immunological diversion, which means that parasites will induce production of proteins that divert the attention of the immune system. So instead of the cells of the immune system will focus on them, the cells of the immune system uh, will be distracted and get diverted. So for example, um, Plasmodium falciparum will infect RBC and this will induce B cells to divide and differentiate into plasma cells without destroying the actual problem, which, which of course would be the malarial parasites. And then they have another technique called immunologic subversion. Here in this particular strategy, parasites will produce proteins and these proteins will act like a homologue of immune system components, meaning immune system will no longer um, consider these particular proteins to be um, to be foreign. Hence, they will not be attacked by the cells of the immune system. Okay, so homolog proteins will include complements, cytokines, or even the HFC or fragment crystalline portion of the immunoglobulin. And they even have a homolog that is similar to the HLA. So can you just imagine some of these strategies being used by the parasites in order for them to survive a very hostile environment inside our body. So, there are several um, laboratory diagnoses that we can utilize um, for the diagnosis of parasitic infection. So, as you can see in the illustration, um, this is an example of immunochromatographic assay for the detection of malaria. Okay, so usually for the laboratory diagnosis of parasite, of course, the ever-reliable microscopic detection of parasite in biologic or tissue samples are still being utilized. Okay, however, this particular technique would require certain medical technologies to be uh, well-trained, okay, well-trained so that they will be able to properly identify different stages, different forms of parasites in various samples. So, for example, uh, one of the most challenging uh, microscopic examination would be malaria. I mean, not all medical technologies are trained malariologists that they're able to easily identify the different forms of malaria, such as the, you know, siguro one of the easiest uh, morphologic form would be the crescent-shaped gametocytes, but other than that, it's quite difficult to identify them without proper training. So that's the reason why um, a junk test to this ever-reliable classical microscopic detection would be either the molecular assays or the serologic methods. Um, if, if, for example, you will be um, employing na, uh, untrained and trained medical technologies to do microscopic examination so so possible the possible um, outcome of that would be a false negative reporting so false negative simply because um, they were able to miss out the correct identity of the parasites okay or worse artifacts may be mistaken for parasites so that's false positive for that matter so, serologic methods would include detection of parasites, antigen or antibodies. And then, most useful when detection of the parasite is difficult or may not even be possible, such as the toxoplasmosis. Okay, um, let's talk about toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is one of the most dangerous type of parasites wherein humans serve as the intermediate host. Okay? So it is caused by a protozoan Toxoplasma gondii. So this particular type of parasite is actually one of the screening tests called the TORCH. Okay, so this particular TORCH test uh, is usually being used uh, for pregnant women because um, this particular type of parasite can inadvertently destroy 
fetus during pregnancy. So, alongside with toxoplasma, when you say torch, this includes toxoplasma, rubella, cytomegalovirus, and even the herpes virus torch. Okay. So, so there are three life cycle stages of the torch of the toxoplasma gondii. So we have the trapezoids, bradyzoids, and sporozoids. So. Uh, how do we get this particular infection? So, so what I've told you, humans serve as the intermediate host of Toxoplasma gondii. So we can get it by ingestion of raw or insufficiently cooked meat, ingestion of oocytes in cat feces, and transmission of tachycytes across placenta to fetus. So as you can see, um, this would be the general life cycle of the Toxoplasmosis. Okay, it can affect our brain, our heart, our eye, and the developing fetus. Okay, so that's the reason why it is called a teratogenic parasite because it can affect developing fetus. Okay, so it's a food or waterborne transmission which means that if you are exposed to areas wherein there are rats, okay, because rats may also serve as the reservoir of this particular infection okay so definitive host would include um, uh, would be the feline animals such as cats so this particular toxoplasmosis are also common among abattoir workers okay because um, aside from aside from uh, this cattle or pigs uh, may also serve as the reservoir and the infection is further spread because of rats okay so toxoplasmosis has an incubation period between 5 to 23 days okay healthy persons could be either asymptomatic or may have mild lymph adenopathy however for immunocompromised patients it's quite dangerous because of the possibility of reactivation as a result of rupture of the tissue cyst or the possible invasion of the central nervous system which of course will eventually result to encephalitis so this scenario could be fatal so congenital infection is also possible as what i told you toxoplasma is an example of teratogenic infection it may cause miscarriage still and even mental deficits particularly the high risk stage would be during the third trimester so serologic test is actually available for toxoplasmosis. So, serologic test determines whether infection was recent or in the past. So, if IgG is positive while IgM is negative, it means that the person had past infection. If IgG is negative while IgM is positive, it could indicate an acute infection or sometimes false positive IgM result. So, that's the reason why we have to confirm it by collecting a second sample from the same patient two weeks after. So if both bands are positive for both immunoglobulin, it indicates possible recent infection or again, a possible false positive IgM reaction. So that's the reason why um, IgG avidity test uh, can be utilized to determine the cause. Okay, so that is Okay, so aside from toxoplasma, malaria is another example, is another example of parasites that can, can that can wherein we can employ serologic tests. Okay, so what are the advantages of using serologic tests for parasitic infection? Advantage, um, the results, particularly if we're using immunochromatographic assay, the result will easily be for, uh, will easily you can easily get the result. Okay, so the technical competency um, may not be as crucial as when you are going to do microscopic examination. And of course, it's quite impossible to do a microscopic examination for toxoplasmosis unless, of course, you are submitting a biopsy materials. And that would be highly invasive procedure, particularly on the part of the patient. So that's the reason why serologic test um, would be really very ideal in this scenario. However, the disadvantage is, of course, the sensitivity and the specificity of the serologic test itself. As you can see in this slide, 
um, there are several um, false possible false positive reaction, which means that the specificity is not quite high when it comes to the serologic test for toxoplasmosis. Okay, and and speaking of and speaking of that, that's the reason why um in some cases um genotypic characterization of a particular gene of interest for this parasite would also be very much ideal. However, uh, for routine purposes, for routine purposes, um, it may it may be overkill um, because of course it will entail so much cost on the part of the patient unless of course you're doing it for research purposes. Okay, so moving on, let us discuss now the fungal infection. As we all know, fungi are heterogeneous group of eukaryotic organisms. Okay, and there could be unicellular or multicellular form. So yeast is an example of unicellular form that reproduce by means of budding. So Candida albicans is an example of that. And then the mycelial form is an example of multicellular form and they are able to produce spores, the so-called conidia. So medically speaking, if this particular fungi can cause infection, so the disease is known as mycosis. Okay, so in mycology, uh, we've learned that there are several types of mycosis. So this includes the superficial mycosis, such as the malastasia furfur, and then we also have the cutaneous mycosis. Okay, epidermophyton can cause, for example, a cutaneous mycosis. And then we have um, subcutaneous mycosis, sporotrix is an example of our organisms. And then we also have the systemic mycosis, such as the blastomyces. Okay, so those this this genus is an example of fungi that can cause systemic mycosis. And then we also have opportunistic mycosis. Um, opportunistic mycosis, um, such as the one caused by Cryptococcus neoformans, or even an even a simple aspergillus or bread mold uh, may cause opportunistic mycosis for immunocompromised individuals. You will just be surprised that immunos, uh, immunocompromised individuals would have fungus ball in the lungs as a result of opportunistic mycosis. So, generally speaking, this mycosis may cause hypersensitivity or there's also a possible mycotoxicosis uh, if it's in just it's food related mycetismus or even tissue infections okay so i think a while, a while ago i was able to run down the different kinds of mycosis okay so superficial mycosis means that um, these are restricted to the outer layers of skin um, cutaneous mycosis affects the keratinized body uh, area of our body such as the skin nails and hair and rarely invade deeper tissue, it is transmitted through direct contact with person or animals. So that's the, that's the reason why they could be geophilic, uh, they could be um, zoophilic or anthropophilic. And then subcutaneous mycosis involve deep ulcerated skin lesions in subcutaneous tissues. So remember, um, sporotic shankais or sporotricosis is also known as the rose gardener's disease. So it is caused by contact of traumatized tissue with soil saprophytes. By the way, the term saprophytes means that these organisms are able to live on decaying organic matter. And then we also have the systemic mycosis, which would involve deep viscera and can spread throughout the body. Now, one of the most important characteristic features of systemic mycosis is that some of these fungi are said to be dimorphic, meaning there are two morphologic forms that say, for example, in room temperature, they are in saprobic phase or they become molds, but once they are inside our body, they would be in the yeast form or the parasitic form. So that is actually possible for different types of systemic mycosis, such as the histoplasma capsulatum. Okay. Do our, does our immune system um, respond to this fungal infection? The answer is yes. Okay, so again, just like your parasites, um, fungi um, respond by means of the innate defenses, uh, such as our skin and mucous membrane, by means of the recognition of pumps by PRR, such as the toll like receptors. And of course, eventually, our immune system will produce cytokine production 
Okay, there would be cytokine production and inflammatory response would also be possible. Now, as regards to the adaptive response, yes, that's also possible. Um, Cell-mediated immunity, which means that T-cells and cytokine production would be activated. And of course, there are also immunoglobulins that will be produced as part of defense against certain fungal infection. So, in order for us to diagnose fungal infection, the most common way is to isolate organisms from clinical samples. So, the most common way of doing it is, you know, when you do skin scraping, skin scraping, and then add potassium hydroxide to that particular skin, and then scraping, and then you look for the presence of, uh, uh, they call it spaghetti and meatball under the microscope. Well, it may be, it may be simple, but nonetheless, it is the gold standard. Okay, maybe difficult because of low, slow growth of fungi. Yeah, that's correct also. So isolation of the organisms from skin from clinical samples uh, would usually be employed using um, appropriate culture media. Okay, the skin scraping, the one that I told you a while ago, is an example of direct examination. But the gold standard, the gold standard is isolation it by culturing. However, there are some fungi that quite dangerous to culture, particularly those that can cause systemic mycosis. Because the in systemic mycosis, the most common mode of transmission would be by means of inhalation. Okay, so what are these fungi that are that are dangerous to culture? Cryptococcus neoformer is an example of such. Okay, histological evidence of tissue invasion, that would also be possible. Skin testing, serologic detection of antibodies, or antigen and molecular assay in we detect fungal nucleic acid but this one is actually not yet widely available okay so these are examples of fungal pathogens so aspergillus is actually aspergillus fumigatus is a common bread mold but in some cases like what i've told you this aspergillus can actually cause it could actually be opportunistic Candida species is very common, particularly among female. It can cause um, candidiasis. Uh, however, um, al although uh, female may be stereotyped to have it, but males can also uh, can also acquire it. Okay, so uh, a mucocutaneous thrush. Okay, mucocutaneous thrush is one of the avid, uh, one of the indicators of having opportunistic infection, usually being seen during category B of HIV infection. Tryptococcus neoformans is another example of opportunistic infection. Pisaplasma capsulatum and coccidoides imitis, these two are examples of fungi that can cause systemic mycosis. Okay, so let's talk about um, aspergillus. So common species are aspergillus fumigatus, aspergillus fabus, and aspergillus niger. So, uh, this aspergillus uh, is actually recovered from soil and plant materials and even spores in indoor air. Okay, so the, of course, uh, if a person is immunocompetent or immunocompromised, uh, it's quite difficult, uh, uh, it's quite dangerous for them to be exposed by this fungi because it may cause external ear, uh, it may cause invasive pulmonary aspergillosis for immunocompromised patients. Or disseminated aspergillosis fungus ball is actually a common invasive pulmonary aspergillosis but for immunocompetent hosts we need to say hosts with normal or competent immune system um, they may even cause external ear infection even pulmonary aspergilloma and allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis so which means alam yung pagpasok ninyo sa room uh, if you haven't used, for example, your clothes for quite some time and you store it in cabinet and your cabinet uh, becomes very, you know, uh, the humidity is very high. So when you wear your clothes, um, it doesn't smell right. So there could be aspergillus on that clothes. Or, or if, for example, even your equipment, such as uh, the lens of the camera, if you're not properly storing it, well, there's a possibility that molds will, will even accumulate in the, in the lens because these molds, these molds would prefer 
environment that is very humid because they need water. Remember, these fungi are actually saprophytes. That's the reason why it's very ideal that if you're storing the lens of the camera, you know, you, you can actually save um, when, you, when you buy vitamins, you can see desiccant, desiccant gel in pillowcase. So you may want to store your very expensive camera with this particular desiccant because this desiccant will somehow remove water and there's no moisture content, there's no water activity, then you somehow retard the growth of fungi such as aspergins. So lab diagnosis would include um, positive tissue biopsy wherein you can demonstrate as shown in the picture aspergillus hyphae, a positive aspergillus culture and detection of aspergillus antigen in serum. Wow, serum. Okay. So uh, let me clarify it, but I think if the sample is serum, it's more of antibodies. But if it's sputum or sputum sample, I think that's where you can detect the antigen. So please read on this particular chapter in 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 our textbook. Okay, so, so it can be clarified. Okay, let's talk about candida. Candida is actually yeast that may exist as commensalistic organism in human host, which means they are commensals. Okay, so which means if they are commensals, they we may harbor it, we may harbor them without causing any harm to us. Okay, they are found in skin and in the GI tract and female genital tract. So Candida albicans is the leading cause of infection. It may if affect. And it may cause diaper rash, vaginitis, female UTI, even oral trash among immunocompetent hosts. But for immunocompromised hosts, oral trash, esophagitis, meaning to say white is mucus patches, okay, in, in the oral cavity, and it will go down even to your esophagus and eventually go down to your lower down to your respiratory tract, causing pneumonia. And at worst case scenario, perhaps septicemia if you have already septicemia pneumonia that is already a disseminated candidiasis usually for hiv patients it is seen in category c wherein the t helper cell level is below 200 cells per cubic millimeter so how do we diagnose it um it's quite easy to recover organisms in the culture media a simple saborods dextrose medium or potato dextrose agar would be enough um, to recover candida albicans, although potato dextrose agar is usually being used in Henry's slide culture te technique. Um, for KOH preparation of clinic clinical materials, that would, would also be possible. So remember, we are only using 10% KOH for soft tissue materials, but for highly keratinized materials, we are actually using about 20% potassium hydroxide. Serologic assay is also possible. Now, what are we looking here for the serologic assay? For serologic assay, uh, we are actually looking for manan and anti manan antibodies. Colonization can stimulate antibody production in uninfected persons, and immunocompromised patients may not produce detectable antibodies. So that's the reason why um, you have to relate um, serologic assays to the clinical presentation of the patients. Molecular assays are also available. These are more sensitive and more specific for diagnosis of early infections and invasive infections though it is not routinely being done because of course of the expenses and costs okay so let's talk about cryptococcus neoformans so it is one of the most common example of opportunistic mycosis it is an encapsulated yeast found in rotting wood and soil contaminated with bird guano or bird droppings usually when you enter caves with bats, yeah, you can actually uh, be exposed to Cryptococcus deformans. Um, so these organisms will enter host via our lungs, which means we can inhale it. It can cause a range of manifestations. So sometimes um, you could be asymptomatic or it may even cause life-threatening pneumonia. It can even disseminate to your CNS and may cause meningitis or meningoencephalitis. So that's the reason why, in some cases, CSF would also be a very ideal specimen for the diagnosis of Cryptococcus neoformans. So majority of those who are symptomatic are immunocompromised, such as patients with AIDS. 
So, if you are using CSF and you want to demonstrate the capsules of Cryptococcus neoformans, we can use a negative stain such as the India ink. So again, as a review, when you say negative stain, you do not stain the organism itself, but instead you are staining the background, leaving the organisms colorless. So since they are colorless, you'll notice that there is a halo, and this halo are actually the capsule of Cryptococcus neoformans. So it's it is easy to find. Very high specificity but low sensitivity and not to mention that it is also dangerous. So that's the reason why do not perform this particular type of test in open bench top. So you have to be in at least biosafety level 2 cabinet. So we can use either serum or CSF for the serologic test of Cryptococcus neoformans wherein we are detecting Cryptococcal polysaccharide antigen. So, we can dilute the serum or CSF in order for us to determine the antigenic titer. Okay, so this particular method may utilize latex agglutination test or even fluorescent assay. Okay, so this is an example of, ah, sorry, LFA is the lateral flow assay. So, these are examples of the lateral flow assay for the Cryptococcus specimen wherein a double band uh, is actually an example of a positive reaction. I think it's much safer as compared to directly examine the organism. Although just the same since you are using CSF as specimen, you have to you have to you have to be at least safe and do not open it in a, in a bench top, open bench top. So you have to be at the bio safe bio safety cabinet. Okay, let's talk about his, let's talk about histoplasma capsulatum. True or false? Is histoplasma capsulatum encapsulated? True or false? If your answer is true, that's wrong. If your answer is false, that's correct. Histoplasma capsulatum is not encapsulated. And perhaps the reason why we call it capsulatum is because these organisms will invade macrophage and they will so when seen under the microscope, um, they are seen inside the macrophage and it is as if they are encapsulated. But in reality, these are not capsules, but instead, they are merely inside the macrophage. So it is a dimorphic fungi. So again, when you say dimorphic, there are two morphologic forms. So in room temperature, they appear like tuberculate macroconidia, but in body temperature they are found inside the macrophage hence the term capsulatum so they are commonly found in soil in ohio river mississippi river buti na lang wala sa pasig river okay so it is acquired by inhalation of mycelial fragments and spores so infections are mostly asymptomatic and self-limiting as except if you are uh, immunocompromised so opportunistic infection is possible in immunocompromised patients such as patients with AIDS. So, if that's the case, it may cause acute or chronic pulmonary symptoms and it can disseminate to organ rich in mononuclear phagocytes or macrophage. So, that's why the term capsulatum. So, if untreated, this particular type of fungal infection can be fatal. So, how do we diagnose it? Culture is possible but again, it's it's dangerous so that's the reason why a uh, majority of, of the lab uh, of the laboratory personnel will employ serologic tests for histoplasma capsulatum okay so what are the principles you can either use complement fixation tests and precipitation as analysis okay so again as a review in complement fixation tests the presence of no hemolysis is is a positive reaction now what are we looking here we are looking for antibodies against the H glycoprotein. Okay? In less than 10% of patients with active infection. It's highly specific. Okay? But again, not all patients will develop antibodies to H glycoprotein. Okay? Some of them will develop antibody to M glycoprotein in most patients. However, it cannot distinguish current and past infection. So, what's the difference? H antibodies against H glycoprotein is most commonly seen in active infection. Skin testing is also positive 
um, because positive two to four weeks after infection. But then again, it will not delineate between current and past unless, of course, you physically, unless you correlate with the clinical history because, because um, skin testing remains positive for lifetime. Okay. So, in some cases, we can also detect histoplasma polysaccharide antigen using urine as a specimen and this particular assay is highly sensitive and highly specific. Okay, so let's talk about another example of fungal infection, the coccidoides imitis, another example of dimorphic fungi. So, the mode of transmission would be the inhalation of the conidia or the spores. It may produce mild infection or symptoms similar to community acquired infection. So, lab diagnosis would include serologic tests, which is the most common. Culture or identification of fungus in sample is possible, again, but it's dangerous. And immunodeficient or enzyme immunoassay tests for IgM and IgG would be uh, easier to perform as, and safer as compared to culture. Okay, so that ends the most common parasite and fungi that can utilize serologic assay. So this again has been Dr. Supache Basit saying, God bless everyone and stay safe. Bye!